You may be familiar with the concept of fight or flight. It's the deep, cutting, physiological response to supposed danger or perceived threats. An immediate and dire choice to confront the danger before you or to flee it completely. Our ancient ancestors ingrained this subconscious physiological reaction into our human nature through thousands of years of evading predators as they lived in an unexplored and uncharted earth. For them, failing to respond quickly enough was the difference between life and death. For us, things are a lot more mundane. In our safe and sanitized contemporary culture, what we perceive to be threats are much less physical than they are psychological. In a life where your physical needs are more or less accounted for, it leaves the greatest threat to your existence to be your own thoughts and how you perceive yourself. A completely different kind of self-preservation. Which brings us to Porter. In his relatively brief musical career, Porter Robinson has released two bodies of work that explore the concept of self-preservation through this fight-or-flight archetype. It was a long seven-year gap between worlds and nurture, but that time between albums proved to be crucial to the bigger picture that Porter would end up painting in his music. Nurture is the antithesis of worlds, and understanding the experiences that led Porter to each of these respective projects helps us understand Porter more fully as an individual. But perhaps more importantly, it enables us to more fully understand ourselves and how we react to our perceived threats. Porter Robinson, an electronic music icon who for about 12 years now has been a staple within the electronic music sphere. Despite being so worshipped within specifically the EDM community that he rose to fame in, his musical catalog is fairly diverse, each project sounding totally different than the last. In fact, it'd be a tad unfair to label him an EDM artist, but it's within that genre specifically that he built his name and reputation. And despite having such a heavy influence within the space he exists today, he wasn't always particularly musical. It wasn't really even until his early adolescence that he began showing any interest in music at all, and it's because of one very important catalyst that Porter Robinson would grow up to be the world-famous musician that he is today. DDR Max. Let's Max. At the impressionable age of just 12 years old, Porter's brother brought home a copy of Dance Dance Revolution for the PlayStation 2, and it seems that that game single handedly unlocked some latent desire within Porter to learn and create music himself. 
Dance Dance Revolution actually unironically super changed my life. And I it just like something about it, like I would just be up there in that room for hours and hours and hours playing. It was my first time hearing Japanese music. It was my first time like hearing electronic music. I so I downloaded like some preliminary music production software and I was like, wait, you can like change it. This realization was the true inception to Porter Robinson, the musician. Enter Echo Wraith. Hands up in the air. I remember being like 15 years old and telling my dad I had gotten a record deal in Germany and I was gonna get paid 500 euros to put out a vinyl of this track that I made called Booming Track. And my dad just being like, like, hmm, I'm like, okay. Like, that's really weird that this is happening for you in Germany. But like, then the check came through and he was like, I guess this is real. Echo Wraith is one of the several names that Porter went by in his early musical career. And though it wasn't the first artist name that he made for himself, it was certainly the one that helped him gain the greatest amount of traction at the start of his career. You know, I feel like a lot of the people who are getting into electronic music now, they see these like DJs on the main stage and they're like, oh, I want to be that. And for me, it was never, ever that. It was never about performing live. It was never about DJing. I was just trying to like make music that sounded like the stuff that I liked and thus the beginnings of Porter's career as a DJ. Not really out of passion for the art itself, but really more out of chance, simply accepting fortunate opportunities that were given to him. My origins, my roots are not as a DJ. I didn't go out watching DJs, I didn't go to clubs. I was seriously 15 years old in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, just at home writing electronic music for many, many years. I started getting requests to go DJ. And I was like, you know, this guy's like, I'll pay you $500 to come to Portland and DJ my party. And I'm like, well, let me learn how to DJ and I will do that for you. I almost had like I chanced into it. I hadn't, I didn't follow this aspiration to be this big DJ. I just kept taking the opportunities that were being given to me. Around 2010, Porter decided he would drop the idea of an artist alias altogether and begin releasing music under his own name. And with this change in identity, he released Say My Name, his first commercially successful track. I made my song Say My Name, and uh, it really resonated with people, and um, that, that's how things got rolling. Electronic dance music began getting huge in the US thanks to genres like dubstep that started out as a kind of niche underground music movement in the UK, but had began migrating over to the US thanks to the appeal and accessibility of many popular UK artists. However, there was one artist in particular who was based in LA who was harnessing all of this forward momentum and taking it to a completely new level. Skrillex. Porter Robinson caught the attention of Skrillex. Skrillex was worshipped in the US. He was the torchbearer of EDM's mainstream popularity. And to this day, he has almost universally agreed to be a legend in the genre. Skrillex caught wind of Porter after Say My Name began blowing up on iTunes and Beatport. And in 2011, Porter signed a one EP record deal with Skrillex's newly formed label and artist collective, Ausla. The EP was titled Spitfire, and it was Porter's first major release. We were starting a record label as well, called Ausla. Porter is my boy, and anything I can do to help him, he's a good person, and, you know, he's stoked. A mere 10 minutes after Spitfire went live, Beatport crashed from the sheer amount of site traffic that Spitfire was pulling. At this point, Porter's momentum seemed unstoppable. He would spend much of 2011 touring with Skrillex and would continue to make valuable connections in the industry that would further propel his international reach. By 2012, Porter Robinson was a household name in the electronic dance music scene. In just two years time, he went from some obscure bedroom producer posting amateur tracks to online dance music forums to being a world famous DJ headlining festivals with Skrillex and co-writing Clarity with Zed. People may not know that Clarity, the song that, is it fair to say like changed Zed's life, was really a song that 
you were on too? Yeah, Clarity was co-produced by me. It was supposed to be a collaboration between me and yes. Zed. We're working on a, a, a long overdue collaboration that's, you know, one part soulful, one part uh, funky, one part beautiful. Spitfire was an immensely important project. Not only did it put Porter on the radar, but it really established his sound. A sound that kind of became its own genre with a name that Porter even coined himself. You coined the term Complexstro. I did. When I came up with the word Complexstro, I was creating my MySpace when I had zero fans. <laughs> and I wanted to have like a nice, funny, cute little portmanteau to describe my sound. Okay. So complex, Electro, Complexstro. I never intended for it to describe a genre or mm -hmm. anything like that. Um, but people started using it and they started describing glitchy bass music, particularly yeah. glitchy electro with it. After only one EP and a handful of singles, Porter didn't seem entirely satisfied with this stylistic trajectory that he was on. In the second half of 2012, Porter released his single Language. Language introduced a more melodic and atmospheric approach to his songwriting. It was much more ethereal, yet it still maintained his signature Electro House style. It was immediately met with high praise, and many people, including Porter himself, considered it to be the best thing he'd written up to that point. Now you told us back in, in Miami at Ultra that you wanted to move toward making music that emotionally affected audiences more. Right. Now, how, how, what have you done to manifest that since then? Well, I mean, language was the big one. That was sort of testing the waters and the response has been magnificent. I released a song called Language, which I felt was risky at the time because I had only released really bangery, like bass line electro stuff. And this song comes out and is a little bit more sensitive and more emotional and it became my biggest song. In 2013, Porter released another single in collaboration with Matt Zoe titled Easy. It was extremely similar to language in its style and sonic blueprint. At this point, it kind of started to feel like he was trying to tell us something, and these two singles were big hints as to the musical direction that Porter was aiming to head. Uh, the first song that, to me, that was really deeply personal and made me feel something real, I think, was Language. And that came out, and it did really well, and that was a moment to me that was vindicating, where I was like, I can make music that I like, even if it's risky, because at the time, you know, language did feel risky to me because I had only been making like electro bassy stuff to that point. Maybe I should just write an album that is 100% exactly to my taste, you know, with no compromises, even things I didn't even think I was compromising on. So what they knew me for was this raucous, awesome, like, party thing. And that's not really where my heart was anymore. And so I was in this weird place where, you know, by playing this music that I had kind of fallen out of love with, I felt like I was being dishonest with myself. What if I just stopped making DJ music altogether? And that was the most liberating thing by far. I was like, holy shit, I'm going to go back and listen to every album that ever inspired me and figure out what it is that I loved about that stuff. And... Um, try to like channel this all into something that's really like really me, you know, the most personal thing that I can do. On February 10th, 2014, Porter uploaded a mysterious 10 hour long video to his YouTube channel. <laughs> This was the announcement of his debut album, Worlds, a project that would end up defying everything that he was known for. It was a blatant and outright abandonment of his entire musical identity up to that point. Worlds was Porter's escape from a life and a direction that he didn't want. Flight. There's definitely a, a big focus on an appreciation for this like sacred thing to me, which is 
which is the, the escape and the fantasy. This entire album was so, so much about escapism and, and fiction. The whole idea of the album, it's meant to feel like this very kind of beautiful, sweet, but kind of tragic escape. Why do we seek escapism? Why are we so enamored by our own imagination and nostalgia? With the advent of the internet and the exponential rate at which technology is advancing, society has been steadily pulling more and more in this direction of leaving reality entirely and living instead in these synthetic and virtual spaces. I kept finding that I was using sounds that evoked like in this era of, of video games, like late 90s, early 2000s, um, like N64 stuff. And then I, you know, in, in, in the art direction, I kept using these low poly 3Ds. That looks, that looks so cool to me and that really touches me because that's, that's what I grew up with. I, I remember when I first started playing around with the idea of using these sort of like N64 sound font style instrumentations of like Ocarina of Time sound and combining those things with like with like Vocaloid, I felt like I had this palette of sort of novel references to, to fiction. And I was like, I felt like the, the angle that I had on it was taking some of that, that like indie music sound and incorporating this sort of EDM and video game soundtrack worldview into it. Just a couple weeks later, he released the album's jarring first single, Sea of Voices. Sea of Voices was completely devoid of any of the styles or sounds that we were used to of a typical Porter Robinson song. Soft, ambient pads, a gentle vocal choir, wind chimes. It was really hard to believe that this was Porter at all. It was at this moment that we as fans began to realize that the Porter Robinson that we all knew was gone. On August 14th, 2014, Worlds was released, and just like that, Porter grabbed us all by the lapels and threw us head first into this new world that he had been carefully and quietly been crafting. begins with Divinity. That was that's the first song on the album, and I think it's the first song that I wrote that was really in the world's style. I felt like I'd kind of stumbled upon the sound of, of worlds. The lyrical content for much of worlds was always certainly secondary to the atmosphere and instrumentals. However, there is inherent beauty in these lines, and the concept of never truly feeling alive is intriguing to consider when you think about how Worlds is primarily about escaping life itself. After a nearly two minute buildup, Divinity drops into a magnificent wall of sound and we are properly welcomed into Worlds. It's such a perfect introduction as it capitalizes on so many of the sonic and thematic motifs that the album is built upon. The album's second song, Sad Machine, stands out a bit. Not only is it world's most popular song, but it's the only song on the album that has a clear-cut linear narrative. Is anyone there? Oh, hi. 
Sad Machine is essentially a love story. It follows the story of an artificially intelligent robot girl who has been living in complete loneliness for more than 100 years, only to be found by a human who stumbled upon where she had been residing for so long. Who survived implies that at some point there must have been some sort of inciting incident that led to the robot girl's loneliness. Perhaps some sort of apocalyptic global event that left her to be one of few to survive. A blinding light could be interpreted as either the physical light of this unknown disaster or the metaphorical light of the human who found her and took away her loneliness that she'd been feeling. The girl who slept 100 years has something after all, and that something is companionship. It's love for this human. The tragic twist to all of this is how painfully temporary her joy will be. The unfortunate disconnect between a robot girl and a human boy is the human factor. The inevitability of mortality will one day leave this girl alone once again. It seems that she's forever destined to be a sad machine. Not bound by mortality, she'll live on remembering the life she had with those before her, those who are now gone. Life, love, and companionship that's now lost. Living forever in her loneliness and never truly knowing who or what may lie ahead. World's entire track list is filled with songs that channel our nostalgia and our seeking for escapism through fictional characters, memories of childhood, video games, and imagination. Years of War is about imaginary conflict and playing pretend as a kid. Fresh Static Snow is about the idea that out of the billions of people in the world, there necessarily must exist some sort of best possible and most compatible partner that you will likely, tragically, never know. There are billions of people out there and you, you'll meet only a fraction of them. And the, the likelihood that your best, that you'll ever meet the person who would make you the happiest is just infinitesimal. Natural Light is a brief instrumental interlude that paints a more dark and melancholy tone. Lionhearted was literally written about the video game Space Invaders. This is like an album that I felt like was trying to express the beauty I found in exploring fictional universes and how meaningful like books and 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 movies and and fiction can be, and it was all through this sort of indie pop lens. Every ounce of worlds takes you out of reality and into somewhere else, whether it be memories of the past or in another world altogether. That said, Fellow Feeling is a track that provides a brief glimpse into reality, Porter's reality. At the time I was very like EDM and like, you know, like, I just want to be known for this other thing. To me, Fellow Feeling stands for, I wanted people to kind of feel what I felt. Hear what I hear. When it came to, like, aggressive electronic beats and, um, you know, where my head was at at that time, how that music was making me feel, I was really frustrated. In other words, Fellow Feeling is Porter lashing out the messy, off-meter bass hits contrasted with the beautiful and lush strings creates an interesting musical dichotomy that represents the internal negative feelings Porter had about electronic music at the time. It provided the opportunity for Porter to take out all of these negative feelings about his environment and channel them straight into his music, showcasing a full display of raw emotion. 
To me, the second half of the song is more of a reference to like language and easy earlier songs of mine. And I wanted to show that I could write this like big, loud, melodic music at 128 BPM, that that was still who I was, um, that that was that fit with my new vision. But this idea of just writing heavy, aggressive beats for the sake of it was, you know, I feel like I was just expressing some like violence towards that idea. Worlds closes out with an emotional and bittersweet fan favorite that hones in on all of the motivic development that's been bubbling over throughout the course of the album. Things like fiction, nostalgia, existing in a world that isn't your own, escaping to a world that we create within ourselves. Worlds concludes with goodbye to a world. This this notion of um, world destruction, of a world disappearing, is, is really dear to me. I've talked about it in interviews before, but... I was very much attached to these online worlds and the thing about these games is that when an online role-playing game that millions of people are connected to goes away and the servers shut down, it's not like other games. Once those games are gone, those worlds that you very much immersed yourself in are gone. That's why I think the whole idea of like a beautiful apocalypse is really evocative to me. This isn't a zombie death thing here. This is this is like pretty, you know, this is a beautiful world kind of disappearing in a clean way. Something very nice to me about this idea of everything closing off and in, in, in a pretty way. I'm obsessed with this idea of like vastness and there's nothing more big than like the end of the world. think that goodbye to a world is about losing everything. Rather, it's about loving what you had and your ability to create something new. It's about being thankful for the world you were able to live in, if not only for a brief moment in time. Fortunately for all of us, goodbye to a world wasn't the end of the world's era. In 2015, Porter released a remix of Nero's The Thrill that scratched all of the same itches that worlds did. And a year later, in August 2016, in collaboration with Madion, we were graced with Shelter. However, a perhaps lesser known inclusion in the world's era discography is Shepherdess, a B-side on the lion-hearted 7-inch vinyl record exclusively distributed through the quickly sold out and now hard to find limited edition world's box set. Written in 2012, it was allegedly intended to be included in Worlds, but was axed last minute for one reason or another. Probably because of the dance-driven beat and hard-hitting drop in the second half that didn't quite fit the tone of Worlds. The song didn't really get that much attention, but in 2016, it began appearing in Porter's live sets this time with a variation in production and a new name. She heals everything. I personally believe that She Heals Everything epitomizes why Porter Robinson is such an incredible songwriter. The honesty and vulnerability in the title paired with the emotional melody and synths and strings it all comes together to awaken this innate instinct to find connection and companionship in someone, to love and to be loved.
I had chased after a musical identity that I was proud of for so long. And I knew when I heard this, that this was going to be a signature that I was going to embrace and actively lean into. And that was a very good feeling. So with your musical journey, do you see Worlds as a finished concept that's done and now we try and do something else? Or is it a, a step on the journey and the next thing is going to take those ideas further? Well, I, I just spent um, two months on tour in the US and I, I came home, I had three weeks off. I wrote, I wrote music for six hours every day for three weeks and I have kept none of it. After that, this is where, this is where, this is how we get to nurture. Gone are the days of simulated worlds, fictitious characters, imagination, and living in your nostalgia. Nurture is about life, nature. I think nature for me is this stand-in for basically health. This idea of things being as they should be, like things being at this stasis point where everything's balanced. I wanted the album to feel up close and I wanted it to feel intimate. Like I knew that like, nature was a good representation of that because it, like nature is real and it's every day and it feels like feels like you can touch it nurture is all about self-improvement and overcoming personal and mental difficulties like your nature is something that you can't change and your nurture is a combination of the experiences that you have and the way that you're treated growing up but also the things that you do for yourself is the self-nurturing thing it's incredibly personal to porter's unique experiences as a musician but really more so as a human I got connected to the idea of nurture because it not only evokes the idea of nature inherently, it also is about the things that you can control and the things that you can change and the stuff you can do for yourself to like leave yourself and the world in a better place. Porter shares his experience in fighting his personal battles through a lens that the listener can easily grasp and relate to. Through Porter's journey of mental struggle and overcoming his inner voice, so too are we able to do so. Sonically, we are presented with a whole new soundscape and style with an array of natural and organic textures. This becomes abundantly clear in just the first few seconds of the album as the first song, Lifelike, begins with a light, gentle, pulsating synth. Gentle piano and strings welcome us to this new world, the real world. Furthermore, consider the title, Lifelike. This is what life sounds like. You can hear faint birdsong with the accompaniment of real life instruments, and Porter's faint but real and untampered voice joining in the background very briefly. I, I tried to use more physical sounding instruments, like more real pianos and some more samples and less synths, for sure. It felt more in that world, it felt less dreamlike and more up close and intimate. The song is only a mere minute 34, but this natural, organic, and real life motif is picked up and carried straight into the following song, aptly titled Look at the Sky. Look at the Sky introduces the main antagonist of the Nurture album narrative, Porter's inner voice, immediately with the first line. We can hear the seeds of doubt being sown into his mind. Is it fate for him to buckle under the pressure of his own doubts and fail as a musician, despite the magnificent highs he felt coming off the heels of Worlds just a few years prior? It is relatively well documented through interviews and a lack of musical output post-Worlds that Porter suffered from incredibly frustrating and persistent writer's block that had a heavy toll on his mental health. On much of the album, I'm singing through this effect that pitches my voice up like an octave and it makes it sound very like feminine or childlike like I, i'm almost doing these duets with myself where i'll sing with my natural chest voice and the call and response will be this little childlike voice or this like feminine voice it's like this duet and you know when you get into the lyrics you kind of quickly realize that it feels like this duet between mm -hmm. my head and my heart mm -hmm. or like yeah like between like what i want to say and what my inner voice is kind of telling me you know what that represents for me is these alternating voices that I feel, one of which is like my anxieties, and then the other part of, of 
is is the my value. It's like there's this clash between the, these anxieties and these values, and I'm tr and I sort of take that dialogue and I'm trying to decorate it in all of this this beauty. But I think there's a little bit of I try to inject a little bit of pain with the lyrics too. Immediately, we are made aware that just as any human is at one point or another, Porter is struggling. He's trying though. If you look at how the first and second verse contrast each other, specifically the lines, but then something must have changed in me, visible progress is beginning to be foreshadowed. Where in the first verse, Porter is referring to how something changed in him which led to his eventual despair, the second verse tells us how something different changed in him. What changed in him this time was his doubts. Whatever he feared, he didn't fear it anymore. Following Look at the Sky is Get Your Wish. This was the lead single for Nurture when Porter announced the album back in January of 2020. With it, Porter posts this, a brief summary of what Get Your Wish is about and an explanation for his prolonged hiatus. You know, around 2015, 2016, Worlds had come out. I remember feeling like I was gonna get back into the studio and like, I felt like I knew like, okay, I did Worlds, it's well received, like I, I know, I know how to do this now. I think there's a natural kind of ebb and flow that comes with, with creativity and inspiration and things like that. And I happened to hit uh, one of the valleys and I just completely overreacted to it. Oh my God, what if I can never make music again? And once that thought occurred to me, it was like I was going into the studio every day with the intention to disprove that idea. That is incredibly infertile grounds for breeding creativity. I think at a point in everyone's lives, we get so caught up in what we're doing and who we're trying to be that we forget to consider why we even bother. Who is it all for? Like, damn, like what, what is the, what is the point of, of all this? What is it that I actually want? And what is it that I am actually trying to do here? Many people live their lives yearning for success, money, recognition, or fame. It seems that Porter took into consideration his own motives, reflecting on his past success and questioning why it isn't as fulfilling as he imagined it to be. Thank you were being you. productive, you were releasing great music, sure. but the struggle for you to make Nurture was very real. I mean, mm -hmm. take us through that a little bit. Right. I started coming to the studio every day with this desire to like, prove that I could still do it. I was just like, it was like this white, white knuckle on the mouse, like, just be like, oh my God, if I don't make something today, like I've truly screwed. That was how I felt. I was really stuck. I was really uninspired. And then the second major mistake that I made was that I like, I thought I needed to put more pressure on myself. I thought that I wasn't working hard enough. That's what like much of, especially 2016, late 2015, 2016, early 2017 was a lot of like, being scared I wasn't going to be able to do music anymore. This constant mental battle is the main overarching narrative of Nurture. Even so, themes of love, gratitude, optimism, and acceptance still trickle through the incredibly dense clouds of despair shown through much of the album. Wind Tempos, for example, is a more experimental, ambient piece that spans over six minutes of runtime. At the latter end of the song is this repeated saying, while it's unclear what or who this song is about, what matters is the emotional tone that's conveyed. It doesn't sound like sadness, but rather hope and love. In Musician and Do Re Mi, he revels for his love and appreciation for music, and the opportunity he has to be a musician despite how discouraged he sometimes feels. In Mother, he pays tribute to his mom, who has been a continual and reliable support system throughout his life. Sweet Time was written about his now fiance Rika, and in Porter's own words, is about being so in love with someone that for the first time in your life, you're scared of dying. You come to realize how there's no guarantee of the, the, the time that you'll get to spend together with that person beyond, beyond the reality that we know, when you know that death is coming, it's like, it's about being so in love that you become afraid to, to die for the first time. Blossom, which is also about Rika, picks up on the same themes presented in Sweet Time, this time through an intimate interaction that he has with her as told through the lyrics. On a walk through the woods together, Porter is stuck preoccupied with the thought that one day he's gonna lose her. 
that one day, we're all out of time. Being the voice of reason that she is, she tells him to stop living the time they have left together in his head, to just laugh. Something that I do again and again on this album is I'm singing through this kind of pitch processing. It's like this sort of mask that I wear to get through some vulnerable sentiments that would be like hard to say in my, my own voice. But on the words, I love you in this song, that effect turns off. It's just that I love you. I didn't want to hide behind the, the mask that I do so often, but I was like, if I'm going to say I love you on one of my songs, like you got to mean that shit. These songs highlight the brighter side of nurture. They are the silver lining to the grim mental struggles that Porter is battling. Mirror and Trying to Feel Alive are what I consider to be Nurture's two most important tracks to the album's narrative, as I believe they properly close out and resolve all of the struggles presented within it. I like to think of Mirror as the final boss of the album. This is Porter finally confronting his inner voice, saying, I know you'll say I'm a burden. Do your worst. I know what you want from me. I know what you're thinking. In interviews, Porter has mentioned that this inner voice he holds within him is at least partially derived from what others have actually said to him in the past. Saying to me, like, you know, you don't, you don't have to do this. Like, it seems like trying to do music is making you really miserable. You, you, you don't have to do this. And it was, it was said from a place of love, but it actually fucking terrified me. There came a point where I would be sitting in the shower for like 30 minutes, not with my phone, but basically engaged in an imaginary argument on Twitter with like somebody who was dragging me or whatever, like defending myself. I, would, I eventually realized like, wait, this is all internal. Like this person who's like dragging me is myself and the thing I'm afraid of hearing. After years of doing this, I was like, wait, this is so unhelpful. The song is a brutal back and forth between Porter and his inner self, never seeming to reach a resolution. That is, until the very end. Suddenly, the narrator chimes in. Sometimes, the inner voice is encouraging, calling for you to run those final few yards. You're nearly there. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. It will all be okay in the end. And that's it. The inner voice doesn't have to be a vice. It doesn't have to harbor doubt. And it won't always do so. Porter finally found this inner voice. And to close out the album, he gives us trying to feel alive. It is the great conclusion to the ultimate struggle he's been facing. I also think like maybe trying to change from like a, a fixed mindset to a growth mindset was another thing too, where like I was taking all of my works in progress Everything that I worked on is this evaluation of who I was. Like, like what I'm making says something about me. And it's so much better if you can take your own works in progress and the things that you're trying to do as opportunities for lessons and opportunities for growth. I want people to believe that I fixed all my problems, you know? Like I wrote this album, I'm, I'm on the other side and I'm just fully happy. Um, but on the other hand, I kind of don't necessarily want people thinking that because if they're sat there thinking, I've been working on recovery for six years, I'm on the other side, I'm still not perfect, what's wrong with me? That's, that's equally harmful. I like to think of the extended intro of Trying to Feel Alive as a sort of end credits sequence of a film, where it cycles through shots of the movie's protagonist in their new, refined mindset after a long and arduous journey. It's a beautiful, encouraging, and emotional, but modest instrumental. It's thinking music. It allows you to breathe and consider everything you've listened to, to listen to your inner voice. After a full two minutes, we get the song's brief but potent lyrical content, the final words we're left with on Nurture. Do you feel better now? I thought I'd run until the sky came out. Do you feel better now? You climbed a mountain. Are you satisfied? These words echo that of Get Your Wish, finally achieving what you've been working toward, finally walking on water, finally getting your wish, only to look ahead and question, what was this all for and what's next? However, this time Porter knows. The mentally taxing journey he faced throughout Nurture taught him what he needed to understand this whole time. Time, 
Satisfaction was never what he needed. Maybe continually feeling dissatisfied is a blessing. Maybe his dissatisfaction is what drives him to continually keep trying, to be better than he was before. Moreover, he realizes who he does this all for. It's us, the listeners. Recall the statement he released with Get Your Wish, where he wrote, You know how every once in a while when you're driving or something, the music you're listening to just moves you in this amazing and transcendent way, where you feel like the world is beautiful and filled with possibility, and you want to cherish every second you have to be alive? I have this experience every once in a while when I'm listening to my favorite artists. I feel overwhelmed with gratitude that they do what they do. I think being able to give people that experience through sincere songwriting is what makes it worthwhile. Somebody somewhere finds the warmth of summer in the songs you write Maybe it's a gift that I couldn't recognize Trying to feel alive Despite the exhausting length of this video, I have really just barely scratched the surface of what I could have or wanted to say about these albums. I could have gone into a tiring amount of detail dissecting every song ad nauseum. Instead, I chose to make this still extremely lengthy video because, among many other reasons, I have a really deep personal connection with Porter Robinson. I've been listening to him since his Spitfire days, and I've loved every project he's touched since. I consider Worlds to be my favorite album of all time because of how deeply I connected with its themes at the time of its release. I've seen him live twice, once at Worlds Live in 2014 where I was actually able to meet him in person, and again in 2016 during his Shelter Live tour with Maddion. The reason I dissected the life out of these albums is because I feel that there is a really interesting thematic dichotomy that exists between them. In the long seven-year wait for Porter's sophomore record, I really had no clue what he might try to attempt post-Worlds. It was my biggest fear that he would just follow the if it ain't broke don't fix it mentality and attempt a Worlds 2.0. Fortunately for all of us, we got Nurture, and now, today, we have two albums that I think perfectly complement each other, both sonically and thematically. I just, like, something that I really needed between albums was, like, part of the reason I probably struggled in the beginning is because I didn't feel like I had something new to talk about. Like, I didn't want to just do the same thing again, and so when I would make these sort of Worlds-esque attempts, it just didn't, I didn't feel a spark in the same way. Um, so... Like, I think that was a, a, a big part of it was like, I needed, I needed something new to actually talk about. Worlds illustrates the yearning to exist in a world other than your own. It's based in fiction. It represents dissatisfaction with physical reality and harbors the idea of seeking to create your own reality, your own world. It's about escapism and finding temporary relief from the constant and incessant life battles that chip away at your determination to keep going by leaving it and creating something better. Worlds is about reliving your naive and innocent youth, where you were able to be anything and anywhere you wanted to be through your wild and endless imagination. Worlds beckons the times of logging into an MMO and speaking with your best friends whom you've never even met in real life, creating your own unique avatar and having a completely new virtual life. Creating an identity for yourself that has nothing to do with your physical traits or limitations. Nurture, on the other hand, illustrates the harsh reality of living in this world. Nurture is reality. It represents the incredibly frustrating and debilitating and inescapable human condition that we exist in. One that we ought not seek to escape, but to embrace, to face head on, and to find happiness in any way. It's about finding relief from the constant and incessant life battles that chip away at our determination to keep going by confronting them. Nurture is about living in the present and not thinking about the time that's left, but just living and laughing. Nurture is about creating your own true reality, your own real life self, creating an identity that has everything to do with your physical traits and limitations. Worlds is synthetic, 
Nurture is organic. Worlds is Porter Robinson seeking to find his true sound. Nurture is Porter Robinson's true sound fully realized. Where Worlds, the previous album, was about this love of fiction and of these other places, these faraway dreams, like Nurture became about this appreciation for the things that are close to us and the intimate and like the real life and like the beauty and meaning that you can find in just like, like the very mundane and the, the everyday. Nurture is the antithesis of worlds. Fight or flight. It's just so worthwhile to live, I think. Like, reality is so, so beautiful if you take a moment to, to contemplate it. Despite all the suffering and, and pain and fear and inconvenience and worry and grief, it truly is a gift to, to be here. Um, and I want to cherish every second of that I can. So I, I tried to put all those feelings into the album and uh, I, I hope they hope they reach you. <laughs>